Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Toby Talks. I'm really excited to have this guest on with me today. His name is Tom Williams. He's a former Harlequins player and he was involved in the biggest scandal of rugby union history. It's Bloodgate. He's here to talk about it and what happened next. Uh, and he's joining me now. Tom, brilliant to be able to talk to you. Uh, I guess the first question is, how have you dealt with the last couple of months? Have you found them challenging or have you been able to use the time to chill out with your family and focus on other things? Yeah, well, thanks for having me, first and foremost. It's, um, what's the best way to put it? I've got three children. One is eight, one is five, and one is just uh, one and a half, or coming up on one and a half. So from my perspective, I've never, despite having finished my rugby career as a coach, I've never taught properly before. So it was a huge learning curve. And what we did as a family, actually, was get back to the basics of what, what, it, take, what it means to be a family. We did simple things like going for walks, whereas before we probably just chuck the TV on or whatever. We did simple things like going for bike rides. And from a personal perspective, it allowed me to refocus on what my business is currently doing and what it wasn't doing very well, ultimately. So I looked at my strengths and I looked at what actually I needed to change and what I needed to work on. And I spent the last 12 weeks or so really focusing on a new product uh, to take to market and, and focusing on, on strengths um, and what I do well and what I can offer that is different to the person sat next to me and providing the same thing. What is it that you're up to these days from, a, obviously you've finished your kind of coaching career, but what have you moved into now? So I left Harlequins uh, just over a year ago in May 2019 after having been there for 17 years. Uh, 15, no, 14, uh, 13 as a player and four as a coach. I, I just got disillusioned with being in the same place for the same group of people, even though there was a turnover of personnel quite regularly, up to 30% of the team every year would turn over. I just felt that I needed to get out of the professional sports bubble as, as high performing and energetic and pressurized as it was, which I really enjoyed. I just felt my, I found myself resenting every moment of it. So I thought, right, it's the time for Harlequins for me to leave Harlequins and it's, I, and I, and they need me to leave as well because I just needed to get into a different space. And I thought, what transferable skills do I have, right? I love speaking to people. I love trying to improve individuals and I, and I, and I really enjoy trying to get the most out of a team to, in terms of performance, not necessarily outcome, but in terms of performance. So I thought, right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up my own leadership and development company. And as such, I deliver leadership and development programs for uh, multinational companies and then I deliver speeches to schools and anyone else who will listen really uh, but what it really allows me is to have weekends back after having not had a weekend since the age of 18 uh, without rugby I now go multiple days without even thinking about the game except for when I check out BBC Sport most days or and or have a reputable uh, sport website. It's an interesting one because people uh, probably think when you're in, you know, when you're in the rugby or the sporting world, it's well, it's a dream come true, and it is initially. But I guess it kind of comes with its challenges as well over the years. And if you're doing the same thing week in week out, and you're not getting to see as much of your family, and you haven't necessarily got the weekends to relax and enjoy yourself, it it takes its toll. So those small adjustments have been probably quite nice for you. Yeah, absolutely. So. <laughs> To be, to be honest, your, your focus changes throughout the year. My purpose when I started playing rugby, actually from an, a younger age, probably sort of 14 or 15, was to play for England at Twickenham. And if I could succeed in doing that, I wanted to play for the British Lions on a tour somewhere in the Southern Hemisphere. And that was my focus from the age of sort of 16. But my son was born eight years ago, and then my focus starts to change. And you start to get more dependencies. And like I say, now I've got three children. What's my focus? Well, actually, running out in front of 20,000 people anymore because I'm so stressed about making mistakes. I got myself into a wrong position. And, and, and I also started getting injuries and I started more and more worried. So I had to change my focus. And my focus then became on providing. What can I provide my family with? What can I uh, arrange and sort out for my future? And that focus changed because I was aware that I was ever going to play for England. I became more self-aware as my career went on. I wish I had that self-awareness when I was younger. Unfortunately, I didn't. But I was aware by the end of my career, I was never going to play for England. And I was probably never good enough. When I realised that, when I became sufficiently um, aware of my abilities, 
it made me think, right, I've got to refocus my attention on what really matters, what I can do really well, how I can try and make the players next to me, the Danny Cares and the Chris Robshaws, be the best players they can be. And I realised, actually, I've just got to pass them the ball and then support them and try and, and maybe if I'm lucky, I'll get the ball back as a winger. And, and that's how I sort of modelled my career. I really adapted and changed as I went on, as my physical capabilities changed and my mental capabilities changed or did my mental the necessity for my mental needs changed as well. So my career was, was, the focus of my career changed over the course of those 13 years completely. And it, and it changed in a way that actually, I, I wish I knew what I knew at the end of my career when my body was capable of doing more. Uh, I wish I was that person who had the ultimate self-confidence I had aged 18, but also with the knowledge that I had aged 28, 29, 30. Uh, and it takes a long time to build up that level of understanding, uh, not only of the game, but of the people around you and also yourself. Um, and often people are impatient, uh, Toby, to, to try and get to that stage. Uh, and some people, the best players, are pretty self-aware early on. I wasn't one of those people. I had to really graft and learn it. It's really interesting, actually, you mentioned there, obviously, uh, I mean, it's an incredibly selfless outlook that you you eventually arrived at where you're able to to look at the likes of Danny Kerr, Ugo Monier, for example, those brilliant players and think you're in a position where you want to, to make them better. That's obviously a, a leadership trait that you've acquired over the years gradually. Was it just going back to the start and, and your upbringing, was it, was it always rugby that you were interested in back at school? At what point did you think, yeah, rugby... Is the career is the avenue I want to go down and make it and make a living from? I love all sports and I played all sports. Anyone said do you want to have a game of this, with maybe the exception of hockey, which I just didn't get. Like I was happy getting smashed in the face uh, on the rugby field, but put a bat, put sorry, a hockey stick and a hard ball. I'm like, nah, I'm all right, thanks very much. It looks like super, so, <laughs> it looks like it's gonna hurt. But every other sport, so swimming, football, cricket athletics, gymnastics, whatever you said, whatever you mentioned, probably I've had a go at it and I love it. Uh, because particularly team sports, the principles are the same. It's an invasion game. You're trying to get your closer to the other team's scoring line or try line or goal, whatever you want to call it. And the ways in which you have to do it are very, very similar regardless. If you're playing tennis, you're looking for space. If you're playing squash, you're looking for space. If you're playing cricket, you've got a one-on-one -on -one battle with this bowler who's trying to get you out. But you're also looking to score runs which needs space. So in rugby and football, it was all transferable skills. So my recommendation is for young people to play as many sports as possible, but try and learn the common threads and themes that translate across all those sports. Uh, and actually, when you take it into a non-sporting environment, it has relevance as well. Where are my opportunities? Where can I see an opportunity within this business that I want to do? If I want to work in this company, where is my pathway? And how do I get to my goal? And, and it's the same it's the same principles it's, it's really interesting because you, naturally you probably when we, when we're talking about transferable skills you wouldn't always i mean it's a very tough it must be a very tough transition for a sports person to make particularly if they haven't gone necessarily through the latter stages of school onto university further education maybe achieved a, de a degree for example it must be quite a tricky transition after rugby and you mentioned the transferable skills there um, mm. Are they difficult to find as such when you come to the end of your rugby career? I think the biggest challenge that a lot of my friends and to a certain extent myself went through, uh, although I had that sort of transition period where I went from playing to coaching before exiting rugby, is, is the sense of purpose. So I talked about the purpose at the beginning of a call when we're talking about my why. I wanted to be the best rugby player. I wanted to play for England. I wanted to play for Harlequins. I want to play for British Lions. You know, that was my purpose. And I loved running out at the early stages of my career anyway, when I wasn't worried about making mistakes in front of crowds and performing in front of crowds. And I, it was amazing to have the opportunity to do so. And I feel so privileged about performing under pressure in those environments. But when it comes to it, it's like, okay, you, you leave rugby and my friends and are thinking, right, well, suddenly I've got people ask, not asking for my autograph anymore. People aren't so interested in having a conversation with me. And you think to yourself, why didn't I do more preparation while I was playing? <laughs> why did I not do one of those open university courses or distant learning courses? So my advice to people who want to get involved in professional sport is do it, but don't be defined by it. Because you finish your playing career or 
sporting career, age 30 or 31 or 32, if you're lucky. And you've got a long time of your life to find, uh, to find what else there is beyond sport. And if you define yourself purely and simply by that, then you'll find yourself in a difficult position where you're constantly battling with mental demons around what do I need to do today? Why are people not loving me anymore? And you go and seek it out. And I've seen it, unfortunately. And it's really sad. People become dependent on this adulation. And it's not something that I ever had. Uh, so I was, it was lucky from that perspective for me. I surrounded myself with incredible people. My wife's an amazing person. She keeps me grounded and always has. And the people around me as well are, are prepared to not always, you know, not that X Factor thing where you're auditioning and they're like, oh, but my mum said I was a good singer. It's like, well, have your mum. That's great. But also have someone to tell you that you're absolutely rubbish and you need to think about something else. Or well, to give you some perspective, I think that's probably a better, a better way of putting it, a, bit of, a less blunt way of putting it. So my advice on that front is to have some self-awareness. What, what is your earning potential in, potential in professional sport? And what are you going to do afterwards? It's always got to be at the back of your mind. And what are you going to want to define yourself by? What principles can you learn in professional sport, teamwork, uh, high performance, working hard, discipline, things like that, but will transfer beautifully to post-professional post sport. You've got to try and think, right, I'm going to be the best person at those elements of my game. And that will lead me into a good place for the rest of my career. If I simply divide myself actually by not understanding that and saying I'm just a good sportsman, you'll take a long time to transition. But if you are defining yourself by I'm a disciplined and excellent performer, that's going to transfer all the way across. And you mentioned defining yourself there. Now you experienced, well, there was a phase in your career that you'd argue, argue you probably felt as though might tarnish you for the rest of your life, which obviously we're, we're keen to talk about. The day was the 12th of April, 2009, and you were playing Leinster in the, in the Heineken Cup quarterfinal with moments to go, 6-5 uh, in favour of, of Leinster. And uh, those final five minutes basically played host to what is described as the biggest scandal in rugby union history. It's a fascinating story for, for so many reasons. Are you able just to talk through those, those final few moments for us? Yeah, so it was... Um... Let me talk, let me backstep a little bit. Okay, so Harlequins, when I first joined in 2002, 2003, had this reputation of being a London club, a city club where they had great links to the banks and financial institutions in, in town, where the players would pretty much turn up, sit at a desk, have a chat before they came back out to training during the amateur days. And rugby went professional in 2000, oh, sorry, 1995. So seven years into professionalism and things were still steeped with, uh, with amateurism everywhere. So um, our head coach, for example, was also our CEO and our CFO and our C COO. I mean, you could, if you can imagine the, the, the process that was going in place, it, it, was, it was mad. And we had this reputation of being full of excellent individuals, but not a great team. And this culminated in 2004, 2005, when we got relegated from a premiership, almost unheard of for a team like Harlequins, the reputation they had to be demoted to the championship or, or national one as it was then. So Dean Richards comes in to try and bring a different element to the club. His first training session, I remember vividly. He bought an old banger of a car and he plonked it on Wimbledon Common, which is, for those who don't know it, sort of a mile round of uh, this massive playing field where Rosen Park Sevens are played. Okay, for those people who are familiar with that. He got this old banger of a car and he got us to push it around the, the field for a, one time. So it's about a mile round, maybe a bit less, maybe a bit more. I'm not 100 percent sure. And we got to the end. We thought, well, that wasn't too hard. You know, four of us pushing in, a, in any one go, taking turns. And it didn't take too long. We got a good lick up. He then puts a handbrake on. And we're like, all right, OK, this is going to be slightly tougher. So we do that. And it was it was quite hard because obviously I was skidding all the way around and it was a bit of a graft. And we thought, OK, this is good team building. And then he made us do it again. And then he made us do it again. And then, then he made us do it again. Being stupid rugby players, of course, we put our hands through the, the back windscreen because we weren't thinking about what we we're doing and cuts up our arms, etc. So, you know, he was brought in with a reputation of success, a reputation that preceded him in terms of his playing career. He had achieved what we had wanted to achieve. He had won premierships. He'd won... Um, uh, Lions caps, he'd won European competitions, both as a coach and a player. 
and he was talismanic. If you can hear, if, for those who don't look, know Dean Richards, what some of the best stories of it, he was carrying the Calcutta Cup down Princess Street in Edinburgh, drinking out of it or kicking it down Princess Street. And that's a great rugby story for you know the, the old school rugby types. And that's the sort of, sort of person that Harlequins needed to bring in post this amateur uh, era we had. So Dean brought a level of grit and also a level of expectation. But with that came a type of leadership that was very unfamiliar, but meant that we had to do what he said. So we had no choice but to do what he said, otherwise we wouldn't be playing. And he was very vociferous in the way that he targeted certain players. Certain players saying, you're not working hard enough. Your background means you're not good enough. You're not tough enough. And there was people like myself and some others. So there was certainly some animosity there. But rather than push me away from Dean Richards, that made me want to seek his approval more. So this, this culminated in 2009 in the Heineken Cup quarterfinal, as you mentioned, April 12th, some 11 year, years ago and three months or whatever it is, not to be three months and 11 days. We're not counting that. But anyway... <laughs> Um, this culminated at about the 60th minute. Nick Evans, a, a, a all black fly half who Harlequins had at the time, he's now coaching there, had been subbed off through injury. Now, one of the things that Harlequins did at the time was always, uh, always say that those substitutions were tactical. So on the substitution cards, you have to say tactical or injury. So we'd always say tactical, uh, as where, where as humanly possible, because if someone clearly gets stretched off, as this was the case with Chris Malone about 10 minutes later, because he ruptured his, his hamstring off the bone. Um, that was therefore marked as a uh, so, uh, injury substitution. So Nick Evans, tactical substitution. And such were the intricacies of the, the blood substitutions at the time, that if a fly half or someone in a specialist position um, gets injured or has a blood injury, it means you can bring someone else back on the field so long as they came off for a tactical reason. So there, Nick Evans was on the touchline, our first choice fly half. Chris Evans, our second choice. Uh, Chris Evans, he's a radio DJ. Uh, Chris Malone uh, gets subbed off as well through injury with his hamstring. And I go on the field. As I'm running on the field, Dean Richards says to me, tell Steph Brennan, the physio, who was on the pitch treating someone at the time, tell Steph Brennan you're coming off for blood. I look at Dean. Okay, I run on the field. I run past Steph. Dino says I'm coming off for blood. Now, fast forward a few minutes, Steph then comes on, passes me a blood capsule, and I've never seen a blood capsule before in my life. And I go, what do I do with this? And he goes, well, when you have some contact, pop it in your mouth, go down, we'll get you off. All right then. And the reason they wanted to get me off, of course, is because I can't kick for anything. We're only 6'5 down. So having Nick Evans back on the field, a re recognized kicker, has increased value in those instances. So five minutes later, I finally have some contact. I'm not injured and uh, I'm taken off the field. And on the way off the field, I'm questioned by the referee. Is that real blood? Yes, it is. Nigel Owen says, off you go, because that's he's covered himself there. And then the Leinster bench go mad. You can imagine Shane Horgan, six foot four of opposition winger, Irish legend, shouting, that's not real blood. That's not real blood. We walk down the, phys the tunnel. We go into the physio room. We lock the door. The Leinster bench and physios and doctors are trying to get in. The ERC, the European Rugby Commission people are trying to get in, banging on the door. And I'm sat there with Dr. Wendy Chapman. And under the pressure and shame and uh, stress of it all, um, I pressurised Dr. Chapman into cutting my lip of a scalpel. And from there, um, at the end of the game, we showed Dean Richards. He then had an interview and he said, Tom Williams came off with a cut in his mouth and my conscience is clear on that. This all snowballed to about, uh, I don't know, a couple of months later or six weeks later when we had a hearing. And the outcome of the hearing was that I had a year's ban. Harlequins had no ban. The doctor had no ban. The physio had no ban. None of the other players had anything. And Dean Richards certainly had no ban. So I was the only one found culpable for this substitution. Uh, ultimately, what the ERC was saying at the time was that I had gone to the Clapham Junction joke shop. I had purchased this one pound. Uh, blood capsule. I had told Dean Richards on the side of a field that I was coming off for blood. I then put the blood capsule in my mouth and then I had orchestrated, orchestrated the cover-up. That was the suggestion from the ERC at that point. Finally, I thought, right, I better get my own representation, right? Because until that point, uh, we, um, until that point, we were 
um, being represented by the same people. So we had one lawyer for all of us. Uh, and finally, at that point, I decided, right, I'm going to have to try and get my own representation. So I got my own representation and we had a, uh, a hearing some two months later in August up in Glasgow, a secondary hearing where my ban was reduced from a year to four months. Dino was banned for four years. The club were fined 312,000 euros, um, which ended up costing more like a million quid. If you consider legal costs that they had to pay, pay and so on and so forth. Um, so that one pound blood capsule that the physio bought from, Clap from Clapham ended up costing Harlequins a million quid because of the decisions that were made, those critical moments where people made poor decisions. And yeah, I just wish I'd come forward and held up my hands much earlier. Uh, but it took a lot of time in between those two hearings where I was really thinking about just taking the fall and falling on my sword and saying, right, okay, I'll take the threatened increased ban that they were saying if I didn't come forward and tell the truth your ban will be increased by another year and I thought well like if I do that then at least um things will keep going because Harlequins were saying some things to me that meant that I was didn't know what to do decision making wise I thought okay so if I come forward and tell the truth they were saying well the doctor will get struck off the physio will get struck off um they were saying that you would impact the former uh, the potential playing opportunities of your fellow players they said that you will um we'll be kicked out of europe and that people will lose their jobs so as such i was at a loss of what to do so it went around for a long time in between that without going into too much detail so so how does it make you feel reliving it now looking back does it does it make you angry um and the reason why you perhaps didn't think twice there was obviously pressure on you being a young player and, and were you fearful then of the consequences for a lo your long-term career uh, about potentially coming forward? No, those are great questions. Um, so it's, Dean was such an influential figurehead at the club and within the game that you, dem you, never, you didn't even question it. So it's what we call, it's, to it's what we call toxic leadership when clearly his decision-making process means that you cannot question it you just do it and of course that leads to bad behavior it got results though that was the thing we were in a Heineken Cup quarter final after all we got promoted from the championship straight away so Dean had got results with us and he got results in the past so he had an implied level of respect as a result of it and it didn't occur to me while I was running on the pitch to say no and it didn't occur to me not to do it and it didn't occur to me two hours later that I should not try and cover it up it didn't occur to me at the hearing, subsequently, um, six weeks later, but I shouldn't try and go along with what was meant for Harlequin. So engrossed was I within this culture, but I thought it was the right thing to do for the club because that's what they were telling me on repeat. Dean Richards and Mark Evans, the CEO, you need to do this, you need to do this, otherwise this will, ha this will happen to Harlequins, this will happen to Harlequins, and this will happen to your friends. Uh, and it'll be like, right, okay, uh, I'll, I'll just do it then. And they were playing it down as well. So prior to that first hearing, they were like, oh, don't worry, if it's the worst you'll get a little fine, we'll pay it. So I'm like, yeah, all right, fine. So I'm a hugely competitive person and I want to win. And I was part of Harlequin's a team that was a hugely competitive team at the time with a hugely competitive, uncompromising leader. And we had got results. And I thought that was what was required to, to happen in order to try and win that game. And I just went along with it. I think a lot of people probably have seen, obviously, the wink that came as you walked off the pitch. Was that a, an innocent wink? Or I think that's what obviously confused a lot of people further down the line is they felt that you had a, a larger part to play. And it probably played into the likes of, you know, Dean Richards' hands beyond that when he's come into questioning that you winked and you were, you know, completely involved in that process. It was, um, was it an innocent wink? Yes. One of the players, Jim Evans, said to me, come on, tough it, Tommy, tough it out. You'll be all right. Um, and I just went and said, I'm all right. That was literally it. It wasn't any more sinister than that. Um, yeah. But of course, it got picked up on and blown out, not out of proportion, because it opened up an important angle for discussion. Um, and my involvement being one of those important angles, my um, cognizant involvement being really uh, integral to um, decision-making down the line. So when I review what was going through my mind, 
there was no consensus decision making going on at Harlequins at the time. There was decision making coming from the top and everyone else just did their job. And that was what I thought was part of my job. The wink, you know, it, it, of course it looks horrendous, especially as it was a terrible wink, but it was remarkably innocent given the circumstances. In that moment, did you consider saying no? And were you aware that this was something that was happening more frequently? It's interesting you mentioned Nigel Owens as you went off, you know, asking you if that was real blood. The Leinster bench went wild as well. Um, did you feel guilty in that moment when you walked off? Mm. I, um, I didn't feel guilty. I felt frightened. Um, it didn't occur to me not to do it. It didn't occur to me that I had a decision that I could have made not to do it. So I did it because I thought that's what needed to be done. I did it because it had happened in the past, although I wasn't hugely aware of it. So in, in, in the past, it had happened trying to get a lock off the pitch. He had a bloody towel on his head, no cut, incidentally. Um, so do I feel, I feel guilty now, but at the time I didn't feel guilty. I thought nothing of it. I felt frightened because people were starting to question me and I thought I looked ridiculous and looking back on it, I did look ridiculous. Um, but I can't say I felt guilty at the time. I just thought I was doing my job and felt frightened that I was going to get found out. That must have been terrifying in that moment when you are walking up, particularly when you were back in the changing room and you were considering having that cut made on your lip. That must have been a terrifying moment, particularly when they were banging on the, the changing room door. You must have really felt at that point that you were in a situation that could blow up. And that's the only reason that I can logically think back and, and realize what, how I came to that decision to try and pressurize the doctor to cut my lip and say things like, if you don't do it, I'll do it sort of thing. So yeah, I mean, the situation was incredibly tense. The culture of the club was incredibly driven towards winning and, and increasingly under Dean Richards uh, was, was toxic and volatile. So I felt like I needed to ratify that injury and that was the only way in which I could do so. With all that in mind, um, and obviously Dean Richards is an incredibly dominant character, um, would you have any advice for somebody that's maybe in a position where they, they need to stand up to somebody or is fearful of saying no because they're, you know, they're scared of that individual and they, they worry about the potential consequences in a working sense or in the sporting world? Yeah, so the fact of the matter is someone's thinking about saying no there, it means they've got a, a stronger moral compass than I had at the time, which is great. So first and foremost, I'm glad that people are considering saying no, that's brilliant. Um, surround yourself with people who will challenge you is the most important thing. So if you've got a decision to make and you've got time to make that decision, bounce ideas off people. Don't just go into your shell and be an island. Don't be your own person. You've got to try and get some outside advice, not from a trusted comrade or anything like that. You've got to try and think, right, what is actually the outcome here? And then when that comes to making any decision, I, I use a three part process from decision making now. Is it morally acceptable? Is it legally acceptable? And can I look myself in the mirror in 20 years time? So if I can answer three of those together and I think, right, OK, I'm making a decent decision now. Great. If I can't, then I've really got to try and get some other advice and think about what I'm doing. Now, when it comes to standing up to someone uh, and having a whistleblowing um, process or, or coming forward and telling the truth, I think that comes down to your individual moral compass and the values you value as a person, for one of uh, the culture you value as a person. So you can use the basis of, can I look myself in the mirror in the morning as, as your guide for that one? Can, can you look at yourself in the mirror, not tomorrow morning, but in 20 years about that decision you made? So yes, you might have a domineering uh, boss or a bullying co colleague or someone like that who will push pressurizing you into making a bad decision or a decision you're not comfortable with or they're doing something. Okay, you could do that and you could go through with that and you could stay quiet, but that could have potential ramifications down the line. By not standing up, that could have worse ramifications than standing up in that moment because you'll have the full force of the law behind you at this stage. Down the line, you won't. So you can stand up, be proud of the decisions you made. And if then things don't go your way and you get kicked out or you get fired or whatever it is, you're not necessarily going to be struck off for any reason. 
but you can hold your head up and you can shift career and know that you were in the wrong position in the first place. You're in the wrong job in the first place. You're in the wrong place. And it's up to the company to look after you. It's up to the company to be responsible for the people they do work, uh, who work for them. So I do a little bit of work for the FCA at the moment, Financial Conduct Authority around compliance. And the huge amount of responsibility goes on to the leadership group and the management group, and less so on the individuals. So the focus being, of course, if the managers get it wrong, it's their fault. And that's going to be trickling down through the, through industries going forward. So my advice is, again, that three-part process. Is it is it morally right? Is it legally right? And can you look yourself in the mirror in the morning in, in 20 years' time? And then you can make some good decisions. And I promise you, at that moment that you stand up, it will be petrifying. But it will be 100% the right decision. Absolutely. And you mentioned there surrounding yourself as well with people that have uh, are able to challenge you and you you mentioned in a recent interview that i watched about how influential your wife was obviously you had the um the backing of the rugby players association as well but your wife was hugely influential in, in helping you through that process i believe because there was a board meeting i believe with quinn's um which she was involved in as well and and helped you kind of begin to to stand up for yourself essentially yeah so um if you can imagine this boardroom we were, this is this is we, i was okay let's go back a second i was given a, a deadline by the erc which they asked after the first hearing and before the second hearing they gave me a deadline to answer five questions and those five questions were things like did you come up with a plan yourself who else was involved was dean richards involved and so on and so forth and their threat was if i didn't answer those questions my ban would be increased from one year to two years now I'm thinking, hold on a minute, I was just the player, I was the pawn at this point. Uh, and it culminated with Harlequins offering me a bribe, offering to pay some of my mortgage, offering to guarantee me future employment, to send me on sabbatical for two years. And of course they were saying all the things on the flip side of that about impacting my uh, fellow players, playing opportunities, loss of sponsors, loss of fans, uh, being kicked out of Europe, so on and so forth. And that culminated in a director's house um, with 13 people in the room. Now, if you can imagine this room, everyone's a rugby person or everyone thinks they're a rugby person. They love the club and they want to see the best of the club going forward. But let's also look around the room and think, is there anything resembling a different opinion in the room? They're all middle-class white guys from Surrey, let's be honest. And so was I. You know, I wasn't middle-aged, but they were middle-aged, but I was looking like I was going to that stage as well. And I was going around nodding, going, yeah, maybe this is the right decision. Maybe I should take a two-year ban. Maybe I should go and go on holiday for two years and guarantee myself future employment. And it took my girlfriend at the time, Alex, who's now my wife, to come forward and say, hold on a minute, this is wrong. So that cognitive diversity, that different thinking in the room from someone who was a recruitment consultant at the time to come into this group of people who were thinking in the same direction was imperative to the success of the outcome, to the right outcome of the whole debacle. Without her influence, it wouldn't have come to fruition as early and as effectively as it did. So she went in that room and she asked two questions. Whose fault is it we're in this position? Dean Richards, is it Tom's fault? And straight away, it humanized me. From being dehumanized by my organization, I was suddenly humanized again. And as such, uh, the outcome was that they came forward and supported me uh, through to the second hearing. And all the while, um, Dean Richards was still trying to implicate me further, saying that I was involved more than he said I was involved, uh, more than I was saying I was involved. It's amazing how somebody can create that culture that everybody then conforms to, you know, into, I, I guess there's probably, there was a fear factor among other um, employees of Quinn's as well to, to follow in that thinking, because it may affect their role moving forward as well. But um, what is your, what's your relationship like with, with coaches now? Well, was it, I say, I say now you're no longer playing or involved necessarily with the rugby side of things, but what was your relationship like with coaches beyond that? And what is your relationship to this day like with Dean Richards? Yeah, so Dino and I aren't the best of friends. That's probably the best way to put it. We uh, we shook hands on a touchline a couple of times and that will be it. But I never expected any more. I never needed any more. I wish him well. Um, I hope he learned from the, um, the scandal as much as I learned from the scandal. And I think more importantly, like not necessarily coaches. So let's transfer it away from sport exactly with managers in particular. I now question more. I now think I need to know why I'm doing something 
and whether it's the reason is justified in doing so. And then if I'm also more likely to stand up for people who need standing up for. So I went into the academy at Harlequins and, and was coaching them for a period of time. And I get immensely frustrated with the expectation placed upon them by the first team coaches. So they would say things like, why isn't he ready yet? And I'd, and I'd simply answer, because he's 18 years old. He's got to be allowed to make mistakes and learn a little bit, but they want to be these perfect human beings. Now that's not possible. And that's not conducive to a long career. That's conducive to producing robots. You want to produce people who have uh, their own lines of thinking, people who are creative, who can mold the future of the game. You don't want people who can just be barked at to do orders and do them over and over again, because effectively you're taking any X factor away from anyone. And that's the same in business as well. So if I am speaking to managers now who I'm working with, my encouragement to them is to go, right, you've got to set ground rules. You've got to do, uh, to be a high performing team, you've got to have a certain level of expectation in terms of work ethic and performance. But beyond that, you've got to allow space for creativity as well. And that's what I really emphasize with my coaches I work with, with my managers that I work with, and with the players that I work with. Sometimes they come to me saying, what do I do if this happens when I'm coaching down in Guildford, the little local team that I work with? What happens if this happens? I don't know, just react, look for space, pass the ball. I, you're on the field, I can't tell you what to do in every single eventuality. There's too many variables in sport. There's so many variables in life as well. And if you prepare yourself to just answer and react in one way, you're gonna get yourself disappointed. You have to be agile and react in different ways. And we haven't got huge amounts of, of time left, but I'm clean. I'm keen to understand what the psychological impact was for you um, as a player afterwards. Was it was it difficult to get back into the game after your layoff? And then, as well as that, during the time that you spent on the touchline band, how did you deal with the the added scrutiny and the added pressure that came from the press, your peers? Um, and everybody around you, because for, I guess for for you, rug, rugby is in, as a whole isn't necessarily a sport that gets the same amount of press as football, for example. Players aren't thrust into the spotlight quite as much, but the whole world was watching you in that moment. What what was that like, and how did you deal with the scrutiny afterwards? I mean, dealing with it's an interesting term. I don't think I did yeah. at the time. I mean, it was it was catastrophic that first game back that I had in October against Northampton at Franklin's Gardens mainly because Chris Ashton broke my nose in two ways, <laughs> in two separate occasions. I had real blood pouring out my nose. So if you can imagine I'm sort of there, first game back, and I was petrified, petrified of being in the spotlight. I didn't want to be in the spotlight. People were wearing vampire outfits in the crowd, right? And I'm there with real blood coming out of my nose. And you can imagine the press, real blood from Bloodgate player the next day. I hated it. And as I said, I did not deal with it at all. I didn't understand what I was going through. The whole... Uh, episode had a huge impact on my personal, physical and mental health. I lost a lot of weight and I lost a lot of confidence and it took me a huge amount of time to get back to anywhere resembling the best version of myself or the new version of myself, I should say, because as I said, my, my expectations, understanding of myself developed over my career and mostly over this period where I realized actually I wasn't going to play for England anymore. Any chance I had was gone with the Bloodgate saga. So now what do I need to do? I need to re I need to revisit myself, reinvent myself and, and try and my best to be known for something beyond Bloodgate. And that was my driving force, as well as providing for my family, was be recognized for something beyond Bloodgate. But it was really difficult. I didn't seek out any sort of uh, help from counselors or psychologists. And I wish I had, it was so naive. But in 2009, it was a different period. It was a different time. We were less aware of it. You were just told to strap on your boots and get on with it. And coaches, was, coaches, coaches would say to me, where's your X factor gone? Well, looking back on it, I know now that I was petrified of making a mistake. I would actively run away from the ball or hit rucks, which were already won in order not to touch it, in order not to make a mistake because I didn't want to be in the spotlight. And it took me a long time to realize that I've got no choice but to do so, otherwise I won't have a career. Otherwise I won't get known for anything other than Bloodgate unless I step up and take a risk again. And that's important. Risk taking is important. Putting yourself and putting your head above the parapet is important because if you don't, you can get yourself into a spiral of nothingness, a, a spiral where you're just cons uh, consensual to everything that goes on. You don't question anything and you need to be that disruptor. You need to be that person who wants to go into an industry and make a difference, not make a difference by being awkward and difficult, but make a difference by doing your work 
extraordinarily well before going on to offering beyond that what your x factor is as an individual whether it be in sport or business and i actually read it recently in an interview with danny care as well he said it was the the best thing that could have happened to harlequins because it cleaned up the game but it was the worst thing that could have happened to you but do you agree with that statement because immediately after it had happened i'd imagine it was horrific and horrific for a number of years and as you alluded to there it was a very very difficult time for you but do you feel now it, it was almost meant to be the way you're speaking about the incident now and what you've learned through your leadership and 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 the profession you find yourself in now do you almost feel like it was ne meant to be a little bit because you you speak so passionately about it no oh, it's kind of you to say uh, i am passionate about it so i'm glad it comes across it certainly molded me from there on uh, it was something that needed to happen from a personal perspective. I was uber competitive. You know, if I'm at a traffic lights, I want to beat the old granny next to me away from the traffic lights. That's just the way that I am. Uh, and if I'm playing football in the garden with my, my oldest boy, Freddie, I try and beat him every time because I just don't think it will do him any favours to live. Of course, I give him a chance, but I end up winning by one goal. So something needed to change in my persona, but I thought it was acceptable behave, to behave in that way. I wish it hadn't played out in the public eye as much as it had. But in doing so, it has helped mould the rest of my career and the rest of my life. And it's something that has happened. You can't change the past, but you can learn from it. So all I'm using it to do now is to try and springboard towards the future, to try and help other people learn from my, uh, I'm not going to say mistakes, it definitely was a mistake, but I'm not going to say mistakes there, from what I've had to go through is probably the better way to put it. Because it was, for want of a better term, a journey that I had to go through. I wish it hadn't played out in that way, but it did. And it has really molded me as a human being and a person going forward. You obviously have spent a long time around a variety of different leaders. Um, what do you think, what leadership style do you feel as though players and maybe people in certain professions respond the best to? This is going to come across really strange, right? From a leader's perspective, you have to be fair to everyone who you're working with. But being fair doesn't necessarily mean that you are being consistent from one internet, uh, individual to another individual because the individual's needs vary. So what your requirements as, a, as an employee, for example, say you're one of my employees, what your, employ, uh, your requirements are from an emotional and non-emotional uh, factor will be different to the person sat next to you, to be different to Mr. Jarvis, to be different to Nick who's on the call as well. Your needs will be different. But what needs to be consistent from a leadership perspective is exactly that. You need to be consistent in your persona, consistent in your demands in terms of what you want delivered and how you want it delivered. Okay, so it is, if you've got a project, these are what you, this is what you need to do. This is the minimum standard of what you need to do. From there, take with it and run with it what you need to do. From 1 to 15, you're going to have different personalities and different kinds of players that need to be treated in that way. Well, and people respond to different things, uh, it's different stimulus. Some people, um, so how did I respond? If you asked me to do something, I'd have done it, clearly. Look, I was, look at Dean Richards, you know. But <laughs> following on from Okay, if you told me to do something, I wouldn't do it. I'd immediately push back. Or if I saw any sort of injustice in anything or lack of fairness in something, then I'd push back. But if someone explained to me why, I'd do it as long as it was a uh, logical and, cogn and, and, uh, and a logical argument, then that would be fine. So that would be what I'd say about that. It's just, it's, it's a question of being accurate of what you're saying and how you're saying it, depending on the individual. And you do have to change how you are addressing to certain people because they respond differently. How I uh, speak to you would be different to how I speak to Mr. Jarvis, because I know we'd get in an argument if I told him to do something, but if I explained exactly why, and how we were going to do it and how it was going to benefit us, then he would he would respond. But someone else might just go, yeah, all right, I'll do it. So you, there's no, see, that's the inconsistency, but actually you're just being sympathetic to the individual's needs. So leadership for me is about caring about the needs of the individual, whilst also keeping in mind the key factor, which is what you want to get out of it at the end. So your needs and Adrian, uh, Mr. Jarvis's needs are completely different, right? This is just an example. But... The outcome of what we want is exactly the same. So, so long as your needs or his needs don't get in the way of that, in which case we're going to have to have a conversation, then we can crack on and treat you differently. But it, the minute they start to try and impact on what we're trying to achieve, that's when we're going to have to have those conversations. 
And, and just going back finally to the rugby field, was the highlight for you scoring uh, a try and then, of course, we, winning the Premiership final back in 2012? I'd imagine that that moment you kind of felt, a li- whilst, you, whilst none of it was necessarily your fault, you had a part to play, you must have felt an element of redemption at that point. So such was our psychology at Harlequins at the time, but anytime anything went right or wrong, we would always have something called a next job focus. So at, at Twickenham, when I caught the ball and it was the most incredible experience I'd ever had, I scored the try. I didn't really think anything apart from getting back to the halfway line, which was our, our policy, having a drink of water and thinking about the next job. Because I scored relatively early on in the game, first 10, 15 minutes. And I knew that there was 65 minutes to go in the game. And I thought, right, it's a hot day. I've got a lot to do. I've got to defend one of the best back lines in the world with two Tua Laggies in the back line. And Marcus, I- not Marcus, I guess it was a prop, but uh, Horatio Guja, really tough competitors against me. And I think, and I'm looking back at it going, right, I need to, I've got to strap on my boots here. This is the highest level I might ever play at. And I've got to, I've got to remain focused. So uh, whilst everyone else was jumping about, I was just thinking next job, next job, next job. And in terms of redemption, I didn't see it like that. Looking back on it, of course, it looks like it's full circle almost. But actually what was really, from my perspective, a more um, powerful recognition of how I'd gone, come back to the best of my ability or made the most of myself, I think that's the most important thing, was the recognition by my peers the following year when I got Players Player. Uh, and being recognised by your peers is awesome like that. So being getting that Players Player award for me was really, really um it was really, really important and a recognition of, of, of acceptance within the group. Because, of course, some of the guys were still really, really loyal to Dean Richards when, when he left. And I, I got a bit of a hard time from those guys. And some of them will still say it was the best environment they've ever been involved, involved in. But, of course, it wasn't necessarily that for everyone. And I just want to finally ask, off topic slightly, best player you played with and against? Danny Kerr and Nick and Nick Easter, the best people I've played with. Um, I said that really quickly because it's an easy answer. And the hardest competitor I've ever played against. Um, there's a couple of really, really guys who I just struggled with, and they tended to be um, a lot better than me. <laughs> uh, one was Mark Cueto. Um, I really struggled just with his height being similar to mine, but he had a longer reach. I just couldn't get near him, and I always used to performed badly against him. And the other guy was who, uh, a guy called Bruce Rehana up in, um, uh, no, that was Bruce Rehana, who was obviously very good, who was in, up in Northampton, but at London Irish, Lossi Taji Takabao was brutally difficult. He was, he could have gone round me, he could have gone over me, um, and he just made me look stupid on numerous occasions. I had to get bailed out by the brilliant Mike Brown or Danny Kerr whenever I could. Uh, but in terms of defending very good fly, passing fly halves, which Mr. Jarvis was, he was up there definitely um, with his deceptive hands, but Charlie Hodgson, uh, he was far better than a George Ford or an Owen Farrell. Uh, to def- to, in terms of defending from a wing against these people, he, he could have flicked it short or flicked it over your head with just the smallest of disguise. And that made him really, really hard to play against. Just so happens that Charlie Hodgson for a long period of his career was in the same team as Mark Cueto. So maybe there's a link there. <laughs> Absolutely. Look, uh, Tom, thank you so much. It's been fascinating talking to you. Really interesting to hear about the whole scandal as a whole and how you've you flipped the whole experience on its head and, and it's turned into a real positive view from a career perspective. And it's been brilliant for um, us all to hear about it. So we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's been it's been really interesting to discuss it from, from this perspective. So I've really enjoyed being on and the questioning has been great. And I hope that uh, something valuable has come out of it. So thanks for your time. Oh,